Psalm 86, 9. All the nations you have made shall come and worship before you, O Lord, and shall glorify your name.
Isaiah 61, 10 through 11. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall exult in my God, for he has clothed me with the garments of salvation. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself like a priest with a beautiful headdress, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the earth brings forth its sprouts, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to sprout up, so the Lord will cause righteousness and praise to sprout up before all the nations.
Psalm 16, verse 8. I have set the Lord always before me, because he is at my right hand, I shall not be shaken. church family. Habakkuk chapter 1. Thank you for joining us in our unique season of worship. I trust the music and the ministry of the word will be a blessing to you this week. Thank you to several of you who have shared personal testimonies with me about how God is using our study in the word or your own time in thinking through the word, our chapter each week. We'll look forward to gathering together here with many of you and hearing some of those testimonies. So let me encourage you strongly to be thinking of how you would share with the congregation how God has served you well through his word in these recent weeks. We have begun a study of the prophet Habakkuk, living by faith when I don't like God's plan. This morning, I want us to press on in this study to understand more of what it means to trust in this God who does big things that we don't always understand. Habakkuk had lived through a period of great revival under King Josiah. Things had been good in the land of Israel under that king. Now, as he has seen this rapid spiritual decline of Israel. He cries out to the Lord, in essence saying, God, you need to do something. And God answers the prophet in verse 5 when he says, I am doing a work in your days that you would not believe if told. And that sounds great. 
at first. Habakkuk may have thought, that's exactly what I want God to do, something that I just couldn't even imagine it would be so good. And then the details unfold in verse 6 as God continues, For behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation. And it begins to dawn on Habakkuk that instead of sending a stirring revival, God is sending the evil Babylonian empire to judge his own people. And this news is, is just about more than Habakkuk can handle. How can God punish Judah's evil by using a nation marked by even greater evil? God's solution is worse than Habakkuk's original problem. So Habakkuk saw the evil in the land and, and says, God, you need to do something. God says, I am doing something. And now when Habakkuk realizes what God is doing, he says, God, you need to do something else. I want us to walk through our text, understand this complaint, Complaint that Habakkuk lodges in response to God's answer. And it's the title of our message, God, you need to do something else. And once we've looked at that complaint, I want us to learn from it. I want us to discover some guidance for living by faith when I don't like God's plan. So let's look now to Habakkuk chapter 1 and verse 5 to see the the details of God's answer to Habakkuk's first complaint. He tells Habakkuk the prophet to look among the nations and see and wonder and be astounded. And then he unfolds the plan. I'm raising up the Chaldeans or the Babylonians. He says they're a bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. The Babylonians were expanding out of the Mediterranean uh, valley, the rivers there, and, and conquering much of the Middle East, the known world. Taking the land not their own. Verse 7, they are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. They are their own standard of right and wrong. Habakkuk rightly summarizes them as an evil people, but they sense none of that evil. Their justice and dignity are all about themselves. <clears throat> Their horses are swifter than leopards, more fierce than the evening wolves. Their horsemen press proudly on. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swift to devour. They all come for violence. All their faces forward, they gather captives like sand. At kings, they scoff, and at rulers, they laugh. They laugh at every fortress, for they pile up earth and take it. So these massive armies are marching against other kingdoms, other fortresses, and nothing intimidates the Chaldeans. Even a, a, a mighty city with massive walls, it says they pile up earth. And you can study history, how the enemy would siege a city. And if the walls were large, they would just begin building a massive ramp of dirt and stone up which they could walk and then overtake the city. Habakkuk is told by God that these Chaldeans will sweep by like the wind and go on. Guilty men whose own might is their God. This Chaldean or Babylonian army was violent. It was fast, quickly taking over the territory all around Judah. And it was powerful. Nothing stood in, it, in their path. What's unique is that we, we knew this was coming. Moses, all the way back in Deuteronomy, which is the time period where after 38 years of wandering in the wilderness, 
The children of Israel are finally at the brink of the Jordan River, ready to cross over and take the promised land. And Moses is urging them not to fail like their parents did before them, not to sin against the covenant that they had made with their God. And in his urging them to faithfulness, he warns them. And in Deuteronomy chapter 28, there are dozens and dozens of verses listing all of the ways that God's judgment could come on them for their unfaithfulness. Verse after verse of a curse unfolding in all different kinds of ways. And when Moses comes to the end of this list of curses, he says, All these curses shall come upon you and pursue you and overtake you till you are destroyed because you did not obey the voice of the Lord your God to keep his commandments and his statutes that he commanded you. They shall be a sign and a wonder against you and your offspring forever because you did not serve the Lord your God with joyfulness and gladness of heart because of the abundance of all things. Therefore, you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you in hunger and thirst, in nakedness and lacking everything. And he will put a yoke of iron on your neck until he has destroyed you. The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like the eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand a hard-faced nation who shall not respect the old or show mercy to the young. He goes on to give more gruesome details that would describe this great fall of Jerusalem to the Babylonians. Jeremiah would recount many of the same details. The people had been warned by Moses for generations to be faithful to God or else this day would come. And now the day has come and Habakkuk is overwhelmed at the thought of it. This was not the answer he was expecting when he prayed to God in complaint or lament, asking God to do something. So now I want us to see Habakkuk's second complaint in response to God's answer. And that begins in verse 12. And as we look at this, know that some of these questions are pointed. If we read them with a tone of anger or frustration, we would likely conclude that Habakkuk had sinned in his approach to God. But if we read them with a tone of, of soul anguish and confusion, then I think we can rightly conclude that this small book has something to show us about how God nurtures our fledgling faith through some of these really tough questions of life. So look at verse 12. This is now Habakkuk's response to what God has described in this Chaldean, Babylonian attack. Habakkuk says, Are you not from everlasting? O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we shall not die. O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment, and you, O oh Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of purer eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? and remains silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he. In verse 12, the prophet refers to God as the everlasting God who is my Holy One. That expression, Holy One, is usually followed by two words, of Israel, the Holy One of Israel. It's a reference to the God who is faithful to His people, and to the covenant he made with them. The God who can do no wrong, who cannot fail in keeping his promise. To which then the prophet adds, almost oddly sounding to us, we shall not die. 
This reflects a faith in God's covenant promise. That God's people will not be completely destroyed. That somehow there, there will be a remnant preserved so that the covenant promise can be preserved. So that the Messiah can come. So that all nations of the earth can be blessed. Verse 13 captures the essence of Habakkuk's confusion. How can this holy God, who is far separated from evil, how can he look on this evil empire of the Babylonians and how can he use them in judgment against his own people? The complaint continues. You make mankind like the fish of the sea like crawling things that have no ruler. This, again, is pointed. It's, it's accusatory. It's, it's a veiled attack. The prophet is saying, listen, God, you're the one who made all these people and all these nations, and it looks like they're people that have no protector, no ruler. You made them like fish of the sea, but he, verse 15, he, this evil king of the Babylonians, he brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet. So he rejoices and is glad. In other words, the, the Chaldeans are, are gobbling up all of these nations and peoples. And Habakkuk is saying, God, you're the one who made these people. It's, it's you who seems to be allowing the Babylonians to, to destroy and conquer and terrorize. Verse 16. Therefore, he, still speaking of this Babylonian king and his empire, he sacrifices to his net. He makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? And that verse 17 question leaves the tension just kind of hanging in the air. So God is, is this Babylonian empire to just keep on gathering in his net and consuming from it and mercilessly killing nations forever? Is this the end of the story? Just watch them devour everything in the earth? Let me try to help you understand where Habakkuk is in his spiritual wrestling. As he's trying to figure out how God's people can suffer greatly at the hands of an evil nation that now he finds out God is using to accomplish his judgment. Let me give you a more modern analogy. Imagine being a Chinese Christian in the 1930s or 40s. You're bemoaning the decline in the evangelical church that was birthed out of the great missionary efforts in China. Think Hudson Taylor and China Inland Mission. And so you begin to pray and to ask God to do something in China. And by the late 40s, God allows Mao Zedong and the Communist Party to take control and to begin trying to extinguish the church for what will probably be the next century. It just wouldn't seem to make sense to you in your burden and the way you prayed and to receive that kind of answer from the Lord. Perhaps you've had some verse 17 moments in your life where you have a question that sounds something like Habakkuk's. God, are you just going to keep letting this happen? Is, is this just the way life's going to be? God, this doesn't seem fair. This doesn't seem right. Are you going to change it? 
God, if this is what you're doing, then you need to do something else. In Habakkuk's second complaint, here in verses 12 through 17, we see an odd vacillation between faith and doubt. A vacillation between something the prophet knows and something he doesn't know. Something that sounds like faith and something that sounds like doubt. But I want you to see that in this struggling faith of Habakkuk, he was hanging on to the character of God. The very reason Habakkuk is in such turmoil about what God is doing is because he knows who God is. And he's clinging to that, who God is, the character of God, while trying to figure out how that character is being translated into the acts of God. So from Habakkuk's confusion and anguish, I think we can learn five lessons about the character of God. So we want to look through verses 12 to 17. Not, not to hear more complaint. We studied more of the complaint last week. But this week, I want us to hear how that complaint, a proper lament, is resting on a foundation of God's character. In some kind of faith, the prophet is hanging on to the character of God, even though he is struggling to understand God's ways. Five lessons about the character of God from our confusion and anguish. Verse 12, the prophet asks in a form of declaration, Are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? And the obvious answer is yes, of course he is. The psalmist would say, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. This is our first lesson to learn about God's character. God is everlasting and will outlast every other kingdom. You see, God himself has just talked about the might of the Chaldean Empire. They conquered the Assyrians. So the Assyrians came and they went. Nabopolassar conquered them in 612, just in few years before Habakkuk's writing. Egypt, the Egyptian empire rose and fell as the Chaldeans defeated them in 605. Nabopolassar and his well-known son, Nebuchadnezzar. A few years later, Jerusalem and the Jewish kingdom falls in 586 to Nebuchadnezzar. And then a generation later, Babylon this mighty Chaldean empire would also fall to the Medo-Persian empire in just one night. And now the prophet is asking, are you not from everlasting? You see, God is not just the next big thing. God is from everlasting. God is God before all Habakkuk's woes and before all your woes. God is God during all of your woes and God is God after all of your woes have passed. From everlasting to everlasting, God is and his kingdom will last beyond every earthly kingdom. Hence his title, King of all kings, and Lord of all lords. Are you not from everlasting? God, are you not bigger than the biggest problems of this terrestrial globe? And the answer is yes. Yes, he is. Then we see, secondly, that God is faithful, and God will save his people. Verse 12, again. 
dwelling on the everlasting character of God. Habakkuk rightly translates that into faithfulness. The everlasting abiding nature of God establishes his faithfulness. He does not change. And when he gives his promise that he will be the Holy One to his people, that promise is sure. And so Habakkuk can say, we shall not die. He is expressing fledgling faith in God's promise to save his people through the Messiah to come. We shall not die. But isn't it true that we do die? The reality of this very story we're studying in the context of Habakkuk is that many, many of the people of Jerusalem were soon to die. We sing, one with himself, I cannot die. But Christians have died in recent months from a virus. Christians have died from persecution. Christians have died as their bodies have given out and failed. So what does this mean? We shall not die. Well, from Jesus' very words in John 11, we learn that our bodies may die but we will live on eternally with our Savior who is the resurrection and the life. So we die physically, but we do not die spiritually. We will be raised to live with Christ. Thus, when we sing that song, one with himself, I cannot die, we go on to sing, my life is hid with Christ on high. So the prophet is not saying, I believe that nobody is going to suffer in Jerusalem. The Chaldeans won't be able to hurt us. Nobody will die. What he is saying is, God's people will not be extinguished by the Chaldeans. God's promise will not prove unfaithful because God is faithful from everlasting to everlasting to save a people for himself. God is faithful. Number three, God is holy and does not cause sin. Verse 13, Habakkuk's observations actually aren't too bad. It's the conclusions that aren't quite right. He observes the holiness of God. You are of purer eyes than to see evil. You cannot look it wrong. That's true. God is far separate from sin. God is holy. He is not a mortal. He is not a sinner. He is set apart from us and from our sin. He is something other than us. God is holy. He is not the author of sin. And he does not tempt men to sin. God is holy. He does not condone sin. And he is never complicit in it. So the observations are right. God is the Holy One. He is more holy than any evil going on. But the conclusion that Habakkuk draws begins to wander into error when he says, Why do you idly look at traitors, the treacherous ones? Why do you re- idly remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? This is the second time that Habakkuk has leveled this charge at God of of seeing the evil, but idly standing by and doing nothing. It was there in chapter 1. Here it is again at the end of the chapter. Do you ever think that God seems slow or silent regarding the evil that affects your life? You feel the sting of that evil. You're seeking justice. You want God to do something and he is silent or seemingly inactive. We like Habakkuk want to know, is God going to act rightly? And perhaps like Habakkuk, we know the character of God, but it doesn't seem 
to mesh with what we're seeing going on around us. And the question begins to, to grow in our minds, does God always act rightly? Because Habakkuk's concern in his context was God taking up an instrument of an evil nation and using it to judge his people. How could a holy God do that? How could he touch or use a wicked nation? Does God always act rightly? And I know we all want to answer that from our theological brain and say, yes, of course he does. But from the experience of our lives, we all probably know that at times we're tempted to entertain alternate answers to that question. When the empty bank account reflects your unemployment, you want to know, does God always act rightly? When a barren womb longs for a child, you want to know, does God always act rightly? When tragedy shatters your expectations of your life, you will want to know if God always does what is right. On nearly every level, from moderate to severe, the pain and disappointments of life tempt us to question if God always does what is right. This is the essence of verses 12 to 17. As Habakkuk again lays out a complaint before the Lord, he's already complained to God saying, God, you need to do something. And when God does do something, Habakkuk is thrown into conflict and turmoil and says, no, God, that can't be it. You have to do something else. And yet through it all, there's the character of God providing that, that anchor to Habakkuk's faith when his life seems to be crumbling around him. We see more of the character of God in verse 12 when Habakkuk says, O oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. He recognized God has ordained the Chaldeans as an instrument of judgment. And he goes on to say, And you, O oh rock, have established them for reproof. You have built them up. You've established them. You've made them what they are and set them where they are to be this instrument of reproof. This echoes what God had said in verse 6 when he said, Behold, I am raising up the Chaldeans. Now, oftentimes when we think of the sovereignty of God, we, we tend to want to soften the blow to our own minds by saying things like, well, God, God allowed that. Or, 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 or somehow God dealt with that and he can take it and, and make it work out for good. But Habakkuk isn't saying that. Habakkuk is saying exactly what God said. God said, I raised them up. Habakkuk is saying, you ordained it. You established this to be such. What do we learn? We learn that God is sovereign and will work all things for our good. In God's plan, he will use even the wickedness of Babylon for his purpose in judging Judah. Do you believe that God is in control even when evil seems to prosper? Do you believe that there is never a time when evil can escape out from underneath that sovereign reign of God. God is sovereign. And he will work all things for the good of his people. Even when he ordains the use of wicked men and their evil sin against him and against others. 
We'll look at this more in the next chapter when God now pronounces his judgment on the Babylonians for their cruelty to Judah. But I want us to see one final element of God's character. And it's there in the question that that Habakkuk finished his complaint with in verse 17. Is this Chaldean empire then to just keep on emptying their nets and mercilessly killing nations forever? And I think what we learn here is that God is just and he will right all wrongs. You see, there is an answer to the question of verse 17. There is an answer regarding the Babylonians. Will they keep on emptying their nets and mercilessly killing nations forever? And the answer is no. This evil empire will not always be this vicious tyrant. They will be judged by God. They will be overthrown. But there is also an answer regarding God because the question isn't really just about the Chaldeans, it's also about this God who seems to be idle in dealing with evil. Will God always stand by and not do something? The answer is, because we know God's character, he will not always delay his judgment. Romans 2 tells us that the wicked are storing up wrath, storing up wrath for the day of wrath. God in his mercy may be waiting, but the judgment day is coming and God will judge the wicked and will make right all the wrongs. I'm sure that you can point to the wrongs that you have suffered in your life at the hands of other people's sinful choices. Perhaps in your growing up years, something happened in your home, perhaps in your college years, perhaps in your marriage, perhaps in the workplace, perhaps your children, perhaps your parents, Friends have betrayed you, whatever it is. Perhaps a church has grievously failed you. Perhaps a legal process didn't work out the way you thought it should have and and the courts failed you. I'm sure you can point out the wrongs you have suffered. What I want you to see is that Habakkuk could too. He too could say, this doesn't seem right. But he had to come to believe that God is just and that God would make it all right. You might hear this and say, yes, but I would say, hold that thought. Hold that thought. I know what you mean. You see the character of God there, but the questions still linger. We want more information. We want more explanation. We want more clarity to how this all works, how how God is doing this when, when life seems so miserable. I know what you mean. And Habakkuk felt the same way. In closing, look at chapter two and verse one. Habakkuk has just finished this complaint. The last thing he said was kind of an implication that God's not doing anything and that the Babylonians are just going to keep on killing people. He wants more clarity, more information. He's still struggling, like you and I may be, to make sense of God's plan when we don't like it. Look at what Habakkuk says. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower And look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. It's an odd use of words. He's he's picturing the watchman on the city walls looking for the messenger to come. And so he says, I will look out to see 
what he will say. In other words, I'm expecting that messenger to come running over the hills and down the road to the city walls and we will all know the answer is coming. So it's kind of blending the metaphor with the reality. God, I, I need to know what you're going to say in response to this. Habakkuk has just laid out his complaint to God saying, I know your character, but I don't see what you're doing. I know who you are, but I don't get your plan. God, I like you and your faithfulness and your sovereignty, but I don't like your plan. Help me understand this. And so I'm going to take my position here and I'm just going to wait for you to tell me what I need to know. In our next study, we will see how God is merciful to meet Habakkuk in his turmoil and in his anguish and begin leading him to a deeper faith. And ultimately, we'll see at the end of his writing, to fuller joy. And so, Lord, we confess that Habakkuk's questions do not sound unfamiliar to our hearts. We have, we have said these things. We have cried out in, in similar confusion, in like turmoil. Would you use your word from Habakkuk to strengthen our faith, to live the life that you have given us today? We ask for this help in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't miss our next study as we press on in the book of Habakkuk. And join us this week in thinking through the word. Every disciple, in the word, every week. We've looked at Genesis chapter 22, Exodus 14. This week, a challenge these books of the law, Leviticus chapter 11. And let me also encourage you, if you're not a consistent reader of the GBC mail, please watch for your inbox this week. Uh, the next few weeks will be very interesting for us. I want to introduce to you this week some ideas for regathering here at the church building in some capacity for worship in the near future. This past Wednesday, Jackson County revised their recommendations so that churches could gather in larger groups than 10. And for the capacity of our space here, that would mean about 72 people. So we're going to work to implement some precautions that would serve you well if you are able to gather with us and try to make sure we know exactly how we can serve those who aren't able to gather as well. So a lot to think on, a lot to implement in this coming week. I don't know if we'll be next Sunday or the Sunday following, but as we work to accomplish that goal of regathering, we want you to be informed. And so please follow along in the GBC mail. Grace and peace to you as we seek to live by faith this week, even if we can't see what God is doing. God bless. Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord. My soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning, more than watchmen for the morning. O Israel, hope in the Lord. For with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption and he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. Out of the depths I cry to you. 
Incline your ear to me, oh.